Okay, good afternoon, Black Health Matters family. My name is Leslie Fontenot. I'm the Managing Director for Black Health Matters. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, this session coming up is gonna be on prostate cancer screening. And joining me for this session is Dr. Lewis Campbell. So African-Americans have the highest death rate and shortest survival of, of any racial and ethnic group in the US for most cancers. One in seven black men have a chance of developing prostate cancer in their lifetime. According to more Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, they are 50% more likely to develop prostate cancer and two times as likely to die from the disease. And with that, black men and their doctors need to really be vigilant and screen for prostate cancer on a regular basis. We should also utilize science and participate in clinical trials, which can also lead to earlier detection and treatment. So again, joining me today is Dr. Lewis J. Campbell of Memorial Sloan Kettering Roush Lawrence Center. Dr. Campbell is a medical oncologist with more than 40 years of experience, including service as a medical officer in the U.S. Army. He has been a member of MSK's Genital Urinary Oncology Service since 1993. He cares for people with prostate cancer and other GU cancers. His focus is on those with newly diagnosed prostate cancer who want advice about the best initial treatment. So with that, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Campbell. Thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate it and we love all the work you do with MSK. Well, thank you so much. I, you. I'm actually, uh, I, I think I should be thanking you because I always look forward to this session. Uh, it's really enjoyable. It's an important message that we need to get out. And I only wish that I could be there in person to shake hands, knock elbows or, or hug at some point, because to me, the personal is, is, is very important. But it's a dreary day. We're all inside. So we might as well just uh, take advantage of it and uh, try and learn something today. So I just want to show you a little bit about the Ralph Lauren Center, which is part of Memorial Sloan Kettering. We're located on 124th Street between Park and Madison, right across from the podiatry school and the uh, Sisters Restaurant. Uh, you can see it's a, a beautiful facility. Uh, this is a map. We're, we're close to the, uh, the uh, one train on uh, 125th and the 2-3 on uh, 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 nearby a uh, couple blocks east, rather west. Uh, we're also right around the corner from the um, Metro North Station. So we're conveniently located. We're there to provide services to the community to aimed at lowering those disparities that were just mentioned. So uh, I think uh, just to clarify, prostate cancer is the most common cancer of men and it is the second most common cause of cancer death in men. Uh, notice, please, that although each year approximately 165,000 men are diagnosed with prostate cancer, only about 30,000 die. And, and the point here is that the vast majority of men diagnosed with prostate cancer do well and, and don't die of prostate cancer, even sometimes when it has spread. It can be a very uh, slow growing cancer, but it can be devastating and that's why we need to address it. So these are, uh, these are statistics for black men. It's the same uh, stacking, although prostate cancer actually makes up a little larger proportion of the cancer burden in African-American men than in white men also. But here's the most startling statistic. And basically what this says is that for every hundred white men, that are diagnosed with prostate cancer, 176 black men will be diagnosed with that disease. So the likelihood of getting the disease is somewhere between one and a half to one and uh, three quarters more than, uh, than Caucasian people. And uh, also startling is the fact that uh, African-American men die more than double the rate of, uh, of white men. And that's just an unacceptable uh, situation. It, it speaks to where our medical system is failing, and we need to do better on that. So why? Uh, probably multi, multiple causes. Genetics may play a role. We, we really don't know about environment or diet, 
Some people think, uh, you know, a high fat Western style diet with loaded with carbohydrates is, uh, may uh, increase the risk of prostate cancer. Um, access to care and culture are tied together. We know that, uh, we, know, we all know the history. There's some uh, maybe uh, mistrust of the medical community and uh, some of our community may have trouble getting to care because of various issues, uh, insurance or lack of documentation or other issues. What is interesting is that when you look at systems where access to care is equal, like the VA system, the disparities, those differences kind of narrow significantly. So providing care can reduce those differences in the impact of cancer uh, based on race and socioeconomic factors. Okay, what is the prostate gland, so, uh, prostate gland and what does it do? So it's a small gland that's part of the reproductive tract and its purpose is to contribute a fluid to the ejaculate that helps uh, the movement of sperm to make fertilization likely. That's what biology wants us to do, to make more of ourselves. So that's why the prostate is there. Uh, if you want to take a more cynical view, it, it's there to create worry for men and work for urologists. So here is a, a cross-sectional view. Uh, this is like a side cut of, the, of your body. And uh, this is the bladder uh, with the muscle of the bladder around it. This is the prostate gland, okay? Now, here's what I want you to notice. The bladder collects urine from the kidneys. Kidneys make urine and the long tubes that come into the bladder where the bladder stores the urine until you're ready to, to go. And if you notice, there is a very small opening tube through which the urine has to flow right through the middle of that prostate gland, get, gland before it goes out. So anything that makes this prostate gland bigger or harder can squeeze this narrow tube and make it difficult for the bladder to empty. And then what happens as time goes along, the bladder gets stretched out and can't push. So we all get the symptoms that men uh, over the age of 50 or 60 are, are all too familiar with. Um, so I think I'm missing a graphic here, but it's okay. All right, so the prostate is prone to many diseases, most of which are benign. There can be all kinds of infections and uh, benign enlargement of the prostate. Uh, prostate gland is very common over the age of, let's say 50, almost all men have it. It's, it's benign, it can cause problems because if you can't really empty your bladder well and urine backs up, it can harm the kidneys. So benign enlargement of the prostate gland, particular for, particularly for African-American men, uh, we, we have to pay attention to, even though it's not a cancer, it can uh, increase the risk of uh, kidney failure, which is already common in the African-American community. And of course, prostate cancer is the other major disease we worry about. Now here's another important point. The symptoms are all similar. So they include things like going a lot, feeling you're not emptying, waking up at night to urinate, waking up frequently at night to urinate, decrease in the size and force of the stream, blood in the sperm, uh, and sometimes erectile uh, uh, dysfunction. Uh, but the, the, these are, are common to all kinds of prostate diseases, not just prostate cancer. In fact, most people with prostate cancer have no symptoms. So if you have some of these symptoms, you should see a urologist, but you should not be uh, worried that it's necessarily prostate cancer. So here is a, a little cartoon that all of us over the men of, all of us men over the age of 50 or 60 know, you know, you wake up and you say, well, should I go to the bathroom? If I don't go now, I'm going to have to go later. And, you know, what time do I have to wake up? Am I going to fall asleep again? And it's nice and cozy in the bed. And this is the way the prostate drives us crazy, even benign disease. Okay, so what are the risk factors? Well, being born a man is certainly a risk factor uh, because uh, women don't have prostate glands. Uh, most prostate cancers occur in men over 65, but we know more and more, particularly in African-American uh, men, it can occur much earlier. Uh, if a brother, father, uh, or child has prostate cancer, uh, then your risk of having prostate cancer doubles. But really, only 10 or 11 percent of prostate cancers are, are hereditary or, or familial. 
Race, as we discovered, as we discussed earlier, is, is a factor. We don't have to repeat that. And the presence of genes that you might have inherited from your parents uh, that predispose you to cancer certainly increase the risk of prostate cancer. The most common one that most people have heard about is BRCA2, which causes breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and uterine cancer in women, but it's also a very common cause of uh, prostate cancer in men. All right, can we prevent it? The answer is, to make a long story short, we really, there is no standard preventative uh, therapy. A couple of drugs were tested that, that suggested a decreased risk if you take these drugs, but it seems the cancers that were prevented were the very minor ones that would never bother you, and maybe there was an increased risk of more aggressive cancer. And because of that and side effects, uh, it's not well accepted. I want you to know that in these trials there were very few American, African-American men, and one would have to wonder maybe among African-American men, if there were enough people in the trial, it would be more beneficial. And that's why we push for inclusion in clinical trials. Okay, screening. So the most common way of screening is a, a PSA blood test that measures this chemical in the blood. This chemical is made by both normal and, and cancer cells, but more of it is made by cancer cells. Um, it tends to be higher if prostate cancer is present, but, and I want to make a very important point here, if you guys get screened, a high PSA level does not necessarily mean prostate cancer. There are many different things that can cause the PSA to go up that are not cancer. So I don't want anyone to freak if we come back with a high PSA and think they're, they're dying. First of all, most men don't die of prostate cancer. Second of all, there are, a high PSA does not necessarily mean prostate cancer. It's not a perfect test. And in fact, the reverse is true also. In rare situations, a low PSA uh, can miss uh, a significant prostate cancer. So another point is there's no absolute normal value. We look at number, a number of factors. The most important one is age. So a person with, let's say, a PSA of five at age 60 is at much less risk of having prostate cancer than a 40-year-old man with a PSA of five. And I just listed a number. I'm not going to go through these. These are just different tweaks that we can uh, look at the, the PSA in different ways to help us decide whether prostate cancer is significant or not. Okay. So does PSA screening for prostate cancer work? The answer is yes. And two trials have shown an approximately 20 to 25% reduction in mortality. Again, I don't wanna go through the whole, all the details. There were some problems with the trials. And again, because of a small percentage of African-Americans, the largest trial was done in Sweden. Uh, you know, again, we don't know that it's applicable, but given the, the threat to African-American men and the uh, efficacy shown in these trials, we strongly recommend screening for uh, all men starting at, uh, we're recommending actually age 40. I think the guidelines are age 45. Um, why not screen? Well, sometimes we pick up cancers and other problems that are not really important, and that leads to a lot of unnecessary testing and, and, and anxiety and because it can miss some cancers. But I feel very, very strongly that African-American men should start screening uh, at, a, at about age 40 or earlier if there is a history of anyone in the family getting prostate cancer at an early age. So who should be screened? Again, by guidelines, men over 45 and, those, uh, 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 and all those under 70. I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. Uh, uh, to repeat, we should probably start screening earlier in African-American men and with a strong family history or those that are known to carry a family uh, inherited uh, trait for cancer. Who should not be screened? Well, if, if you already know you have prostate cancer, then there's no point in screening. But the big issue is that because prostate cancer, even uh, when it's found, rarely hurts people in the first five or 10 years after diagnosis, so that if someone is very, very old, and of course that's a subjective opinion, and we know that some people at old age are very fit and younger age are not, but generally if people are very old and or they have a lot of other serious medical problems such that our, their life expectancy is less than 10 years, then it's really not worth screening because you're unlikely to find a cancer that's dangerous and you're more likely to die of something else. So currently, 
the recommendation for those over 70 is to discuss the pros and cons with their primary physicians. It's kind of waffling because it's really not clear what to do. And a lot of it is up to the person. Uh, you know, uh, having uh, passed 70 many years ago, uh, you know, I certainly don't feel old. So I know that uh, many men between 70 and 80 will want screening, but you have to understand again that you're not likely to die of prostate cancer uh, at that age and that sometimes screening can lead to, lead to interventions that might be dangerous. Uh, other than uh, uh, PSA, you know, the role of uh, Digital rectal exam, which is very uncomfortable, it's not clear. It probably misses all but the very large cancers. And going forward, uh, we are looking at uh, using MRI uh, to help us better predict who might wind up with a, a biopsy that's positive for a significant cancer. And let me digress here a minute. I, I keep using that term significant cancer. The point being that many of the cancers found are not significant. They're very low grade, they're small, and we can uh, determine by various analyses that most of these cancers will never bother the patient in their lifetime. So it's important to understand that even those who are diagnosed with prostate cancer, maybe I'm repeating myself, that doesn't mean you're gonna die of cancer. In most cases, you're gonna live with it or get cured. Uh, so we think, and, and, the, and the point is, we really don't need to find those cancers that are not gonna bother you. And MRI and going forward, precision screening based on gene tests and molecular tests uh, may help us spare people who are not likely to have aggressive cancer. We might be able to spare them the biopsy, which is painful and can have some risks associated with it. Okay, so what happens after screening? So if, if the PSA is hot, if we consider the PSA high for your age, we might advise you to see a urologist for consideration of further workup. And again, there are different things they can do at that point, the MRI. Uh, th at that point, they might want to do a digital rectal exam to see if there's a, a, a nodule that can be felt. They might want to do a biopsy, but they might not. And uh, we, we do have an interesting study going on at Memorial. This, this is not a randomized study, where, uh, and it's not a treatment study, but African-American men with high PSAs uh, are being tested to see if an MRI-directed biopsy does better than the standard biopsy in African-American men. Now, those whose, PS, whose PSAs are normal for their age will be advised repeat screening at, at intervals, and those intervals depend on what the PSA is and what their age is. So we have an algorithm. Again, I don't want to go into it, but if your PSA at age 50 is X, then we might tell you you need to come back in three years or one year or five years. And in fact, there's certain men that we might say, you don't ever need to be screened again. We know, for example, if the PSA is less than one and you're 60 or over, it is highly unlikely that you will ever get a dangerous prostate cancer. So the take home message here is, we might send you to a urologist for the high PSA because we're worried about cancer and we wanna do further testing. Or sometimes we might say, see a urologist because you have symptoms of severe benign pro uh, prostate disease. But those who we don't send to the urologist, we will advise screening at some later date again. The, and that time interval depends on what, how old you are and what the PSA is at this time. Uh, so how do we diagnose it again? Uh, no symptoms in early age, in early disease, urinary symptoms and ED uh, are usually not related to cancer. A lot of men have this as they get older and the vast majority of them do not have cancer. They have benign enlargement of the prostate cancer or other reasons for erectile dysfunction. Uh, we talked about the DRE not being that useful except if the PSA is high, or sometimes to get a sense of how large a benign prostate is. In terms of treatment for uh, prostate cancer, uh, for localized prostate cancer, there's surgery, radiation, for increasing amounts of patients, active surveillance, meaning we just watch you. And I just saw some data presented at a conference uh, about two weeks ago showing that even for African-American men, active surveillance is a, is a safe and uh, a, a, a useful uh, approach. 
And we're also looking at things, uh, can we just destroy the cancer? So localized prostate cancer, high cure rates, many different options, more and more people, including African-Americans are just being watched, but watch carefully. For advanced prostate cancer, it hasn't changed much in 80 years. We want to get rid of testosterone, which feeds that cancer. And then if that fails, there are other options. All the issues related to quality of life seem to focus on urinary symptoms, bowel symptoms, and sexual dysfunction as complications of, of treatment. And that's what I think is one of the major scary parts of this and, make, and major disincentives. Good news, disparities, disparities disparities are narrowing, maybe due to better access to care and increased screening. And uh, some studies have indicated that with treatment, African-American men do as well, and, and maybe even better than uh, white men. So we have a lot on the horizon. There's a lot of precision therapy coming down the road. And I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer questions. OK, now I do see the Q&A. Uh, 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 pop up, so I'm going to take them in order. Diet, diet has a modest role. We do think that Western diet with a lot of red meat, uh, carbohydrates, uh, processed foods uh, may increase the risk of. Uh, are you uh, are you hearing my answer about diet? Uh, Western diet may predispose a, a healthier diet, which includes less red meat, uh, poultry pork, fish, vegetables, fruit, less processed foods, less carbohydrates may reduce your risk slightly. Uh, is there a male menopause? There can be. There may be many reasons why testosterone drops uh, as we get older, uh, but generally men do not go through the same kind of menopausal symptoms that women do. Their testosterone levels remain uh, normal unless we lower them uh, for treatment purposes. Um, question, patient got seed implants two years later, he was diagnosed with two types of leukemia. That's a good question. Um, probably not. Um, we know that radiation can increase the risk of leukemia, but usually not this kind of radiation and not this soon. Okay, CyberKnife. Um, CyberKnife is just another form of radiation. It's probably as good. Uh, the the, the exact optimal type of radiation we use is still under investigation. There are a lot of studies going on. I think it's a reasonable option for certain men. Okay, do you study and address the social determinants of health? Uh, absolutely, um, absolutely uh, yes. Uh, we actually at the Lawrence Center implemented a tool whereby every patient that comes in uh, uh, can be um, encouraged to voice those factors that may uh, impact negatively on their care if they're having financial issues, legal issues, uh, other health issues, family issues. So absolutely, I think, uh, you know, uh, social, social determinants of health has become an important part in, of medicine in general. It gets a lot of attention. We hear about it at every meeting and it's almost negligent not to look into that. Do you feel watchful waiting is the best option for African-American men who tend to have more aggressive? So again, again that, that's a good question. First of all, I wanna distinguish between watchful waiting and active surveillance. Watchful waiting is, you know, your 90 year old great grandfather who, uh, you know, is uh, in a nursing home uh, has a, a, tiny, a tiny prostate cancer. And patients like that, we generally say, look, we're not gonna follow, we're just gonna see what happens. And if, it, if the prostate cancer acts up, we'll deal with it then. The term we use is active surveillance, active being the key role. That means we watch you carefully, but we don't start treatment right, uh, right now. So it certainly would not be a good option for someone with aggressive prostate cancer. But if based on the biopsy and the MRI and the PSA and the exam, it does not appear to be an aggressive prostate cancer. Research seems to indicate that African-American men do as well, excuse me, as white men with active surveillance. And uh, again, at that same meeting that I alluded to just a few minutes ago, a paper was presented and showed, for example, that when African-American men 
do come to treatment after being watched, they, their extent of cancer is no worse than uh, white men and their outcomes are the same. So I think uh, for patients that have uh, low risk cancer, active surveillance is still a good option even for African-American men. I hope I answered, I'm, I, I, uh, if, if I didn't, um, I'm not doing that well with the uh, technology here, but the answer, the quick answer to the question about uh, African-American men and, um, what, and active surveillance, yes, it's a reasonable option. And yes, uh, socioeconomic determinants of health are critical. So this, this is the same question. So are, are men encouraged to get tested after a certain age? Yes, I did mention this in the talk. I think uh, the standard recommendation by the US Preventative uh, Screening Task Force is 45. We recommend age 40. And if there's a family history, it should start 10 years earlier than the age at, the, at which the youngest person in the family got prostate cancer. Why is there uh, hesitancy to screen? Uh, yes, of course it's better if, he's, if, he, if a man, uh, well, let me read the question. Why is there hesitancy to screen? Is it better for a man to know if he suffers from prostate cancer than to not know? Generally, yes, but uh, you know, we, we, we have to start, be, we have to look to being able to focus our screening a little better. One of the downsides is if we, if we find a very uh, unaggressive cancer, it creates a lot of anxiety, subjects you to tests and, and risky procedures. And again, for older men, it, the, the cancer is not likely to help you. Uh, why is there hesitancy? You know, people are afraid. They're afraid that you know, if they're diagnosed, they're going to have to be treated and that's going to affect their sex life and they're not going to be able to, they're going to have to wear diapers. And that's not necessarily true. If you, if you diagnose this early and you need to be treated, not every man needs to be treated, remember that. But if you need to be treated, the earlier you diagnose it, the less likely you're going to get into those com complications of treatment, like uh, not being able to control your urine, needing, the, needing a diaper or pad, and even sexual dysfunction. Uh, are there times when surgery to take out the prostate gland is recommended? Yes, we generally favor that for younger, healthy men who can undergo surgery, but radiation is always uh, a safe alternative option. For men over 50, what type of annual screening do you recommend? Uh, right now, um, right now, the um, We recommend PSA uh, uh, alone. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's probably the best we have, but stay tuned. We're looking at, at ways of taking blood tests and picking up DNA from prostate cancer years and years ahead of, of uh, the PSA. So this is a, a changing field. Right now, I recommend uh, PSA screening Again, starting at age 45 for most men and, and 40 for African-American men. Uh, we don't have anything better right now. Although another thing that is happening is the use of uh, MRI. Okay. Looks like I got the thank you note. So uh, it's been my pleasure to be here and answer these uh, really interesting questions. I, I miss everyone there. Uh, I really, I look forward to next year where maybe, and, and hopefully we'll all be healthy and happy and can see each other in person and, and, and catch the, 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 the karma and, and the goodwill and, and uh, the enthusiasm there. One last thing, I want to congratulate my colleague, Dr. Carol Brown, who I understand is being honored today. Uh, I can't think of a more appropriate person for such an honor. Uh, Dr. Brown is a wonderful colleague and friend, uh, very helpful test at the Lawrence Center, and certainly uh, dedicated to the uh, fight against healthcare disparities in cancer. Thank you very much. And thank you so much, Dr. Campbell. This was such a great 
informative uh, presentation as, a, as we can see by all the questions that came in. And we wanna thank our sponsors, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, as well as Maya Vaughn for being part of this presentation and sponsoring it. And we wanna invite you all to go visit the booths, the exhibit hall and visit MSK booth, as well as all the other booths that are there. So enjoy the rest of the day, Dr. Campbell and, and Black Health Matters family, please tune in to our next segment. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you all.